just begin to stir ourselves up in our heavenly language. Lord, dominion and glory belongs to you, Father. We thank you, O oh God, for your presence on today, O oh God. Lord, that your glory will begin to saturate the atmosphere, O oh God. Let Lord, that Holy Spirit, O oh God, will begin to come in as a rushing mighty wind today, O oh God. We declare, O oh God, that you are the refining fire, O oh God. Lord, that the fire will begin to purify us, O oh God. Lord, that the fire will begin to cleanse us, O oh God. Lord, that we would be pure, O oh God. Pure, O oh God, from excuses, O oh God. Pure, O oh God, from procrastination, O oh God. That we would be pure, O oh God, in the level of our integrity, O oh God. Because of your glory, Father. We declare your glory in this place on today. Lord, that your virtue, O oh God, would be instilled in us, O oh God. Lord, that you would purify us, O oh God. That we would have the virtue, O oh God, of you, O oh God, walking in us, O oh God. Lord, that our thoughts, O oh God, would be purified with virtue, O oh God. Holiness and righteousness, O oh God. We declare it today.
until they see the ancient of days Till we are like the sovereign one Until they see Jesus Until we are like the sovereign one Until they see the one who's raised Till we are high and like the lifted up one. Yes, Lord, you're high
with this fire. We give you glory for that this morning. Come on, as those hands are lifted, let the refiner of men manifest. Let the God who answers by fire make his appearance in you as the one who burns forever. Let the virtue of the sovereign prevail. And let a people of purity emerge in the fire. Those whose hearts have been set ablaze by you. And we prophesy this morning that in this fire, every idol burns. That in this fire, every enemy of God is consumed. Let the purifier of men manifest. This fire come. Come on, just begin to lift your voices and declare fire. Come on, fire. Fire. Let the fire of God manifest. Fire. Spirit of burning, come. Spirit of the living God, come. Activate your flames of love. Activate your flames of vengeance. Activate your flames of judgment. Let the burning one manifest. Let the burning one manifest. Let the refiner of me and manifest. Let the purifier of me and manifest. We want your fire. Come on, somebody shout fire. Come on, fire. Oh, hallelujah. Listen. Bring it down. Messengers of fire. Come in our midst. Take the coal from the altar. Touch our lips. Send us, God. We will go in the name of the Lord. Let the messengers of fire come. Messengers of fire. Look at y'all. It's a real song. It's a real song. I gave it to Rika, so we're going to have Rika to come. She's going to lead us in this very quickly. Let's put our hands together. Come on, put your hands together and bless the Lord. Messengers of fire, come in our midst. Take the coal from the altar. Touch our lips. Purify us, God. In the name of the Lord, we will go. Come on, say
In the midst of a glorious people In the midst of a powerful people In the midst of a powerful people Set me a place Set me a And the Bible declares That Saul went up to the place Oh he went up to the place Oh he went up to the place Oh the place Oh the place Oh the place Where the people prophesied Where the people joined in Where the people gathered Where the people lifted God Where the people glorified In the midst In the midst In the midst In the midst In the the Bible declares That Saul would be a flame and your ministers fire say Lord make me a flame and activate your fire hallelujah come on one more time put your hands together and let's bless our God hallelujah come on let's bless the Lord people of God hallelujah we are a blessed people with diverse kinds of abilities and talents. We're grateful for our fearless worship leader, Prophet Melody Calhoun, and the awesome team that we have. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. God has deemed us to be his battle axe, his weapon of war. And in our Father's house, there's a cachet of weaponry designed to advance a people. And um, as Elder Val was leading the charge, and I kept hearing this thing regarding uh, this refiner of men, producing a people of virtue. Uh, Refining is necessary uh, to to become a people of quality. One of the processes for commodities that come out of the earth, the context of oil, gold, and other precious metals and stones, is that before these things become market-worthy, and really carry the level of value that Father has ordained, he takes them through a refining process. And the refining process removes all of the impurities. So crude oil can come from the ocean seafloor or from a desert in some distant land, but it's no, it doesn't carry any value until it's refined. And then it activates uh, power to um, move through an automobile to heat a home and other things that it does. And so you and I, in our raw state, need the refiner to come and sit among us. Uh, 
God because he wants to make us a flame and he judges stuff in the fire as well. Well, I got a brief word for you here. We're going to go for it. Uh, let's put our hands together one more time and bless the Lord. And um, we have um, a special presentation we'll be doing at the end of the service uh, as a means of bestowing honor upon one of our beloved. So I want all of you to stay engaged. And uh, we're just in the season of, of celebration, of supernatural breakthrough, of enlargement, of increase of capacity. Just great things are happening for us as a people, and we are so grateful uh, to the Lord. I want to extend my sincere gratitude to um, this entire house and people from all around the, the country that uh, celebrated on, on, with us on last week uh, for Resurrection Day. And I think uh, I know by the Spirit of God that a new dimension of honor has come unto us as a people just based on our willingness uh, to do what God has ordained. So I, I proclaim blessings over you and your family. And just as um, a notice for you, in the month of May, we're going to be dealing uh, with the subject of the fear of the Lord. And then in the month of June, we're going to be dealing with uh, generosity as the DNA of God. And there's going to be a special Father's Day blessing that we're going to release to the house in the context of just inheritance. Something that God has been challenging me with uh, from a few of our prophets regarding inheritance. And so we want to make sure that we solidify it. And I thought, what better day uh, to release uh, the Father's blessing than on Father's Day, even though Mother's Day is next month. And that, that's the holiday of holidays. We know that. That trumps everything. It packs out restaurants. It empties shelves and stores. But Father's Day, you can neander around and casually move. Not too much happening here or there. Uh, so we want to make sure we have a special celebration for all of the mamas in the house as well on May the 8th. Say May the 8th. May the 8th. All right. And then there's the Love with Intention meeting that's taking place in the month of June. So make sure uh, that you register for that meeting uh, and all the information uh, for that conference is available at the resource table. So as you exit, make sure you get one of the flyers. And uh, there's a code you can scan as well to take you to the registration page. Make sure um, that you register and come out in support of our very own prophet, Yolanda Garner, and her endeavor to extend the kingdom of God through love. Amen. Extending of the kingdom through love. And just a quick house, house information. We do have a leadership meeting immediately after uh, the, the conclusion of this morning's service. So for all of those that have the invite to that meeting, make sure you find your way to the library. Let's go for it here very quickly. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. According as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby, somebody say whereby, whereby. are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Notice how the promises, uh, the precious promises is, are, are what connect us to or to empower us to become partakers of the divine nature. And then we can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. And verse 5, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, say virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Now, uh, I want to talk for a few moments about uh, some of the, the wisdom of God, I believe, in the making of an extraordinary people. And make sure you jot down some good notes. And uh, we'll try to pick, up, uh, pick this up a little bit more on, on next week, um, per se, and bring some conclusion to this phase of teaching. But I want to emphasize these things. Divine power, glory and virtue, promises, and then divine nature. When you think in terms of the movements of God and all that he does, uh, I, I stumbled across, a, a, well, I, I would say stumbled across, but I believe Spirit of God gave me a thought about uh, God in the context of him being a lifter of people, a lifter of men. And so I did a quick word search, and I found in over 200 references where God raises, he raised, raise it, or he simply raises up a people. And in Exodus 9 and 16, God raised up the prophet Moses for one thing, to show his power in him. And then number two, that his name might be proclaimed throughout the earth. And one of the, one of the, one of the ways that God lifts a people is that he imparts virtue. And virtue can be simply comprised of a threefold perspective, a people who, are special, who have special worth, a people who have um, transcending grace upon them where they conform to a standard that's higher than normal. 
And then people who have strength of mind. In other words, they are people who are governed by boldness and competence. And in life, you will find that there will always be a need for you to understand your worth. It will help you repel the systems of men that will seduce you into compromise only to devalue who you are. Are you listening to me? And then there's another aspect of virtue that really has a strong bearing when it comes down to what we deem to be morally sound and upright before God. And there's an internal compass that will always lead us to uh, live a transformative life and to conform, to conform our lives to uh, the wisdom of God to be a standard for what it means to be morally sound. Like there are arguments in the earth about people's orientation that I really believe that if the church had risen to the level of maturity we should be at in this day and age, we could simply just let our lifestyle speak for us. We could simply let our healthy families and healthy marriages do the talking for us, and it would kill a lot of time wasted arguing about things that in our current state we don't have power to change anyway. This is where, this is where when you really understand the price that's been paid for you to live this life in Christ, there are a lot of arguments that are taking place in your soul that will be silenced by way of virtue. There are a lot of things that would have seduced you in the previous season and put you in captivity that will lose its power to lead you astray by way of virtue. This is where God is at. And I, 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 I purpose in my heart, I said, Father, help me to not just pastor a bunch of spiritual people. I don't want to pastor people who make their mark in society and leave an indelible impression upon their generation that Jesus is Lord. Not just in word only, but in deed. And that is going to be through the reckoning of our lifestyles with everything that has to do with his righteousness and his power, his, his, his holiness and his, his awesomeness. And this is where a practical approach to living a supernatural life becomes so powerful. Before we take an attempt to do anything in the name of God, let's take tremendous steps to be like God. Virtue. Virtue is what's going to yield the promotion that we could never get through an academic process, nor through pragmatism, and nor through who we think we are. It's simply where men will lay their eyes upon you, and they won't see you. They will see the glorious one who lives inside of you, and not because you're trying to gain attention to yourself. It's like almost like the, the Father wants to. Things that have been allocated for us, that have not located us, the moment we step into that zone of virtue, your goods are going to find you. Your substance is going to locate you. Your connections are going to be fulfilled because God looks on the inward part. And we can master at perfecting the outward appearance all we want. That's, that's pseudo-Christianity in the context of living a life for Jesus. The way that the, the kingdom works is from the inside out. And we've got to then come into compliance with the standards of the king in our conversation in our deeds, you know, I, 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 I ran into an individual recently that had a history of speaking ill of me, and it came back from multiple sources, and we know we're not to receive a word of accusation and all this other stuff, but when you know the history of a person, and when, when you see them and time has lapsed and, you know, a season has gone by two or three, people have a tendency to forget some of the foolishness that they partake of, and then they expect you to have this dumb clause as well. But the thing that empowers us to be a righteous representative of even when I know you don't mean me any harm, I can give you a kiss. Even when I know your historical track record has been to trash me and to um, uh, align me with evil stuff and make my name malignant and use me in the context of telling a lie or some false narrative, and I see you in the flesh, I can still bless you. Why? Because the behavior that you exemplify has disqualified you from even being in my realm. No one has ever left your life that was of value to you. Let me say that to you again. No one has ever left your life that was of value to you. You have to realize that sometimes your worth will repel people that you have a tendency to prefer over the purposes of God. But you cannot live a virtuous life and still have things that resonate 
with activity that's beneath the realm that God has called you to. It does not make you better than any other human on this planet because your mark of distinction is virtue. I shared in the 830 service that there's one thing about every human being that's a mark of distinction for them besides your DNA. But your DNA can put you in a pool with other people and they can kind of almost sort what family, what clan or, or whatever you come from. But your fingerprints, your handprint, there's nobody on this planet that has the same hand. You can be identical twins and you still got different fingerprints. Why? Because it's something about your hand that resonates an extension of who you are in God. We are the handiwork of God. And you have been created for a special purpose because you have special worth. And then virtuous people or people of virtue, uh, they, they have this thing known as strength of mind. They are courageous people and courage is never needed until danger is present. We're living in dangerous times. There's a need for the rising of courageous leaders who carry a dimension of virtue that sets them apart. And it's not their ability to dispense wisdom. It's not their understanding of historical narratives that led nations to war. It's the dimension of excellence on the inside of them that serves as a standard. And their real mandates and warrants things. And if they have the Prince of Peace inside of them, everywhere they go, the Prince of Peace will manifest himself. See, that is what we want. And so when we prophesy from that place of existence... When we share the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge from that place of existence, it activates continuity. God wants to raise you up to be a type of person that your generation, your family, your sphere of influence, your place of employment, your, your, your field of training expertise has never seen before. He is activating this church to become a people of quality, of substance. We're going to major on being as God is, and then we'll minor on doing what God does because you can can do what God does and never change the way you think about life because your gifts and your calling are without repentance. All right. Virtue then is the seedbed for all extraordinary people who will live to do extraordinary things. Virtue is your mark of distinction that separates you as a superb individual from things around you that are mediocre. Do you not know that people who have identity issues do things sometimes unbeknownst to them to attract attention? I was sharing with a group of leaders last night. We were talking about uh, from Proverbs chapter 4 that we're to guard our heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. These are senior leaders, lead pastors, a part of an organization that we lead called Global Strategic Alliance. And during this conversation, we emphasize about 12 different issues that every authentic leader will have to deal with because these issues will challenge you. And one of them is the issue of developing people to be Christ-like whose identity has been hijacked through issues in their natural lives, issues imposed upon them by society, and issues that have been stirred against them by the powers of hell to disrupt and distort their identity. One of the signs of, of, of leading successfully is having the capacity to help people remove layers of pseudo-identities and help them discover who they really are. Not what they can do, but who they really are. This requires virtue. This requires being a people of virtue in the realm of business, in the realm of entertainment, whatever sphere you're called to. Uh, your mark of distinction is always going to be your virtue. And, this, and if you think about virtue, it takes divine power to live a virtuous life. It takes partaking of divine nature to live a virtuous life because that is what helps us escape the corruption that is in the world governed by lust. Because the fall of humanity was connected to an appetite. They saw something that God had deemed off limits. And then all of a sudden it became desirable to them, but it was under the influence of the God of this world and his seductive conversation that led Adam and Eve to abdicate their relationship with God and serve as the altar of their appetite. And a lot of saints are doing the same thing. Divine nature is necessary because there's a nature that's innate in you. It's connected to your natural family lineage and the mindsets, the behaviors, the, all, all the operations, the way you view life. It's connected to your natural lineage, your upbringing, your training, uh, your educational uh, 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 preparation, whatever the case. You'll view life through that. And this is why the nature must be changed. There's some stuff you grew up doing that's illegal for you, but it's still lawful in your family. 
You need virtue to break those connections and separate yourself to live superb and not be bound by the mediocre position of a family. See, people don't want to hear this. This is hard because the stuff that we're in agreement with that's dysfunctional, that brings a measure of pseudo peace to us, we don't want to let go. God highlighted this to me. He says, son, any environment where the gospel is preached is going to be a turbulent environment. Because the more truth is released, the more lies are exposed, and then the more challenges are created intentionally for people to grow. He wants us to grow. Can you imagine walking the streets of Galilee with Jesus? And you hear him call a group of people a brood of vipers? <laughs> And say to them, who have warned you to flee the wrath to come? Can you imagine walking the streets of uh, uh, the dusty roads of Galilee with Jesus and then Jesus telling folk, you whitewashed sepulcher, you are full of dead men's bones. You would have a problem with this conversation because it was hard language until you know his nature. He couldn't be just and righteous and allow what was happening before him in the name of his father to take place and not challenge it. That does not give you and I the right to start calling folk whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. If you ain't got no power to back it up, you might get jacked up. <laughs> Jesus had power. He stirred them devils up the Bible and he escaped another way. That may not be the case for you. Virtue is eternity's metric system that helps identify what people are known for versus what they are known for, what, what people are known for versus what they are known for doing. I am known for being a father, a husband, versus doing what? Preaching and teaching and prophesying. You, be, 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 we want to be known for what we can do. But virtue empowers you to be known for who you are. Who are you when there is none of that? I was talking to one of our young people, and they were giving me a list of, of, of action items that they were checking off. And I said, well, look, I'm beyond that. My life is boring. It's an exciting boring for me. It is. I, I, I feel like I, lead, I live a boring life because all of the years of excitement are beyond me. I'm in my season of rest. I don't need nothing to stir up my adrenaline. I pray in tongues. I don't need nothing to get me excite, excited. I talk to my granddaughter. You know, as you progress in life, things change about you. So, and I was just, I'm like, man, I remember that. And I said, you know, the last three old ride I got on was in the summer of 1989. It was a ride out of all names called the Demon. <laughs> and I tell you, it stirred the devil up in me, and I ain't been on one since then. Can't do it. Can't do it. It's not my realm. So, areas that we can focus on and target to develop. And become a people of virtue, your emotional, physical, relational, mental, social, and spiritual development. All those areas taken together and sometimes can be a painstaking process, but they in fact will empower you to become a superb human who lives a par excellent life. It is important for us to purpose to be a people of excellence in the context of virtue. Do you not know that sometimes your wisdom in the context of transactable good stuff you can do sometimes is not warranted when God wants to elevate you. People are going to check the database of your character to find out are you doing what you do from a place of purity? Is there issues of you being corrupt? Are there things synonymous with greed? You know, it's, it's almost like, like if today for any one of us, if you were calling to an audience where there were rich and wealthy people whose wealth it's on a whole different realm. Would you even know how to conduct yourself at the dinner table? You're going to just start grabbing. I'm, let, me, let me get a little bit of that. Man, look like some Vienna sausages over there. I'll take some Vienna sausages. What that is? That's hoghead cheese. Let, let me get a hit of that as well. What them little black things look like? Pearls. You said, I want to eat any fish eggs. Uh, I, don't, I don't eat none of that. We ain't that. You got some catfish? You got some tilapia? Maybe I get a, no. You know, it's, it's, all, it's almost like there's a proverb, and I'm paraphrasing it, is that when you get in the realm of a ruler... Don't let your hunger get you jacked up. It's best to cut your own throat. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing it. Why? Because when you get around certain realms of functionality and an invitation is given for you to come into it, you should expect it. 
as a believer. You should be expecting your immediate supervisor or manager to simply tell, you know what? I need to train you as my replacement. Nothing in me wants to do it, but I have never met a person like you before. You know, I've gossiped in the break room about you. I've said a lot of stuff, but I know you're my replacement. I keep having these dreams about you. Let me show you how to do this. And I already made a recommendation to the department head. Because something else opened up for me elsewhere. True story. Friend of mine. Been on a job over 20 plus years. Said there was one personality that was a demonic adjutant. And he prayed, God, remove this man out of my sphere. And within a matter of days after the level had got so high of tension, the man came and said, I'm leaving the company and going to do business with my family. The same demonic adjutant comes and tells him, I'm not your boss. I, I guess it was just his parting uh, uh, greetings or whatever the case may be. And, and, and the man of God said, he said within himself, I know you're leaving. Thank God. <laughs> it's already been orchestrated. People of virtue, when you get into certain realms of giftedness, where everybody is gifted and functioning at optimal levels of charisma, What's your mark of distinction? What is it that gives you credence to stand head and shoulders above the rest? Your virtue. Your virtue. When, you're, when the transactable goods of your gift are not warranted, it's going to be who you are and not what you can do. And some of us in the current state that we're in, we're discontent with who we are because we know there's more for us to become. All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 in the Amplified Classic Version, make sure you look at this translation, the Amplified Classic Translation. You, therefore, must be perfect, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the King James Version simply says, be ye perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. But I like the way this comes out because it's emphasizing what we're dealing with uh, for the last couple, what we've been doing the last few weeks in the context of virtue and then this, the, the, this, this produce known as integrity, where you're stable and doing what's right and being upright. It has a lot to do with soundness in the context of your moral position in life. People of integrity are not easy to find. People of integrity are not like random stones that you can just pick up off the ground anywhere. No, they, they, there's a dimension of distinct, distinctness that's connected to them because God has designed you to be so. And if you don't know that you have special worth, if you don't know that God, in fact, has strengthened your mind, if you don't know that God has given you transformative power to conform to his standard regardless of, of what the world is throwing at you, then you're going to always dumb down your value and never see the fruit of virtue. When you make up your mind that I'm going to live a clean and pure life, the options for you to do wrong don't disappear, but the gravitational pull they have on your soul is weakened. When you make up your mind, you're going to be just. The opportunities for you to do unjust things don't go away, but the temptation to do unjust stuff weakens. And eventually you'll find yourself rising. This is why we've got to challenge the status quo. You are not the family you came out of. Why? Because your citizenship is in heaven as a born-again believer. Why do we put so much stock on bondage and pain versus healing and promise? Why do we put such an emphasis on some of the stuff we go through in life versus the life that Jesus paid the price for us to live? Jesus didn't call us to live a mediocre life. Everything about him is excellent. Everything about him uh, is, is, is decent, is in order. Everything about him uh, is above the standard. Everything about Jesus, uh, is, it, it resonates with power, is clean, is pure. And you and I as heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, we've got to make up our minds. I am not going to invest my life in this gospel to live an average life. 
I'm not going to have an average life financially. I'm not going to have an average life relationally. I'm not going to have an average life concerning my career. I'm not going to have an average life in my health. I'm not going to have an average life based on where I live, an average life based on what I drive. Let me help you, people of God. When you really marry the mandate to be virtuous, it is through divine connections by way of other virtuous people that God will change your life. God will change your life. Like for anyone that has a therapist, you get a therapist that is excellent in what they do and whatever kind of counsel they're giving you is designed to show you what your life really looks like within the context of what you're getting counsel for. Then to provide you with some virtue in the context of excellent knowledge to help you properly disconnect from that stuff and then move into being who you are supposed to be. God didn't design the believer to live with pain because Jesus took it. How could he take our pain and bear our sickness in his own body, be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of our peace comes on him, and with his stripes we're healed, and then we still go through all the stuff that's already been settled for us. Thank you, Lord. The emphasis of virtue and integrity in, th in this verse are the personification of being perfect. Notice how perfect is consistent with two specific things in the context of growth. Godliness in the mind and then character. When you, when you really, I, I, the, the, uh, as an author, a preacher uh, that wrote the book, the, uh, the Battlefield of the Mind or Battlegrounds of the Mind, Francis Frangipane from some years ago, uh, is, is quoted as saying that we are a house of thoughts. I'm quoting directly from that we are a house of thoughts. And when there's a lapse or absence of godliness in the context of the way we think, there's going to be a lack and absence of godliness in the way we relate to our world. And when there is, there is an immature state of character, there will always be a life governed by poor choices. When character is missing... Because character is what connects us to the image of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus is highlighted as being the express image of the invisible God. That word image is character. It means an exact resemblance, stamp, copy, or a representation of. So when you think about the born-again believer, now the image of God is restored to us. It empowers us to live a stellar life in the context of character. That's where your virtue is at. These are attributes that highlight who you are. And when believers do not have Godliness in their mind. One of the mysteries of the Bible is the mystery of godliness. How Jesus or God was made manifest in the flesh and caught up in the spirit. It's, it, it, Paul tells Timothy that there's, there's a great controversy surrounding this. And then this same God, by way of his spirit, lives in the born-again believer. And a big part of our perfection is developing a mind and a thought life that's governed by godliness. Do you not know that the, the, the way we think drives our conversation? Do you not know that the way we think also defines our orientation? It's, it, it'll have a lot to do with the positions that you take in life. And one of the most challenging things for any person involved in leadership when you steward other people is to develop a healthy trajectory of thinking for the folk that you are called to serve. Lay the template out. It's still up to the saint to walk that course out, but it's got to be laid out. By faith, God framed what? The worlds. So that means that now, the way I think, as a man think it so is he, faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word. The word should superimpose itself to really give me proper context, framework for how I think about said things. Uh, and then the word should give me content, supply me with the attributes I need to live within that framework. Mm. Let me talk to this side. Some of the stuff we say that's illegal and unauthorized in God has to do with an uh, absence of godliness in the mind, it creates framework. Now you find yourself living in structures governed by things inconsistent with God, but it's tailored to the way you think. Getting our minds renewed, being transformed by the renewing of our minds, moving into realms where certain mind molders are broken by the power of God and displaced is always intentional. No real growth takes place without being intentional. You say, well, 
I beg to differ. Because all I did was sit down and eat, and I started growing. You ate intentionally. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't like your hand just made you start eating them chips and dips and all that. No. It was an intentional course of action put on repeat. Satan didn't make you get drunk. No. You went to the liquor store. You bought that bottle of elixir. You got your change back if you paid cash. You received the bag from this, the employee in the store. You cracked the cap. Well, I didn't crack the cap. I gave it to my homie, and my homie cracked the cap. Well, be technical and stay a drunk. A lot of times we want to blame people for where we're at. Maybe it's the absence of godliness in the mind of a saint that puts us in predicaments and frames our world, especially the unfavorable worlds. Come on, just, just, as, a, just as a sign of, of, of hands, how many of you have found yourself living, in an as, living an aspect of life with a world that you framed and regretted being there? Do you not know that regret for the virtuous believer is one of your most potent enemies because when a window closes and a door of opportunity shuts and you are no longer able to move in it, regret has a way of impeding your health, messing with your rest. It'll affect you physiologically. It'll mess you up relationally because when opportunities are lost and regret sets in, it's rough. It's rough. And you got to look at life like this. Let me not live today to regret tomorrow. I want to be a person of virtue. You, therefore, must be perfect. Growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character. Your character, puts, it, 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 when it's put on display, it says to the world, this ain't what I do, this is who I am. This is who I am. That's, that's what your character says. It's, it's who you are. It's the essence of who you are. It's the culmination of your body of work, and it speaks when you are silent. Okay. Because it influences the hearts of people. All right. That's why understanding how relationships work is important. There's such a wisdom for divine relationships that's emerging, and because everything in life rises and falls on relationships. A lot of us in the area of being developed personally, have made some bad choices because of an absence of virtue when it comes down to relationships. But let me say this to you. For every bad thing that happened in your life, you can trace it back to a relationship. Every good thing that's happened in your life, you can trace it back to a relationship. Let me help you. The moment you came into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, good stuff. I'm, I Only good comes through that relationship. It's a relationship. Remember these guys who were fishes of men? And they were distraught, and they had been out fishing all night, and a divine connection showed up in the person of Jesus. What happened to their, to their, to their, to their uh, uh, profit margin deficit? It was changed instantaneously because they, they would deplete one night, and the next day they moved into a realm of robust capacity and net-breaking ability. Why? Because of a connection. I prophesy divine connections coming to this house to change our status overnight. And when you are people of virtue, that is when you start attracting people that carry stuff that you need. Sometimes the connection is just a connection to get a connection. All right. People of virtue constantly make room to accommodate God's growth plan for them. The moment you stop growing is the moment you validate hell's limitations against you. Let me say this again. The moment you stop growing is the moment you validate hell's limitations against you. Now, let's be honest. All of us have dealt with limitations in some form, right? Communication limitations, relationship limitations, economic limitations, educational limitations, housing limitations, transportation limitations. But when you purpose to stick with a plan. To do what? To overcome the limitation, what did you do? By way of your volition, your own will and effort, you overcame it. All right. Don't marry hell's mission to tell your mind this is it for you. Because the moment you marry that mentality is the moment you validate the limitation. 
May these things be supernaturally displaced from your life. And you understand and become sensitive and supernaturally aware to the power of a divine connection. Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. I want to read this quote to you very quickly from uh, the late Nelson Mandela. He said, as I have said, the first thing is to be honest with yourself. You can never have an impact on society if you have not changed yourself. Great peacemakers are all people of integrity, of honesty, but humility. Nelson Mandela. This is powerful because you think in terms of God sets a local church in a territorial grid and gives them everything they need to influence that community, to impact it economically, socially, educationally, to deal with infrastructure issues, family, household, uh, job issues uh, as the church grows and matures. But the moment the church stops growing and maturing, then the limitations in the community affect the church as well. That's why we got to grow in virtue. And interestingly, when it really comes down to being a facilitator of supernatural stuff, integrity, has to be a part of it. There's a pastor from the 1800s. I had never heard of this man of God, and he was a part of the um, Presbyterian Church, and he had pioneered a work in New York as well. His name is Pastor Harry Emerson Fosdick, and he's quoted as saying, with many overhead schemes for the world's salvation, everything rests back on integrity and driving power and personal character. So that means that on a personal level and on a global level. The key to really impacting change and releasing reformation is tethered to integrity and character. Isn't that something? Because you can change the world by simply changing you. You know why? Because you'll look at the world different. You'll see society different. A lot of the warfare that many of us are dealing with in here has a lot to do with promises that we need to get in here. God has given you a vision to do something, and every turn you make, there's a limitation to force you to bring that, bring that grandiose idea down a little lower. Bring it down a little lower. Bring it down a little lower. Bring it down a little lower. Then when it gets to hell standard, stuff starts opening up for you. And you feel like just because you're doing a portion of it, you've done a favor. No, Ezekiel, eat the whole roll. Eat the whole roll. That must be our mindset. I'm not on this planet to exist. I'm here to dominate. I'm here to dominate. I'm here to, I, you, 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 you're a business owner, dominate in your business sphere. You're an entrepreneur, dominate within that sphere. You rise, become the cream dollar cream, and you refuse to settle for anything less because there are mentalities that are in the air that are being perpetuated by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience that wants to make you dumb down who you are. Virtue says different. Now I'm going to end on this. Psalm 84, verse 11, the Passion Translation. For the Lord is brighter than the brilliance of a sunrise, wrapping himself around me like a shield. He is so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. Those who walk along his paths with integrity will never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all. Now, this is powerful to me because in the King James, it talks about the Lord being a, son, a, a, a shield and a buckler and, you know, some of the other things it kind of references. But I like the way the passion brought this out. So people of virtue are beneficiaries of God's manifest presence. How many know that Psalm 1611 says that in God's presence is fullness of what? And in his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So that means that in the presence of God, I can have joy. Joy is not based on a state of existence or a condition. It's supernatural. When you should be governed by sorrow, joy breaks in and lifts you. When you should be in a pit of depression, joy breaks in and elevates you. When you should be going through the motions of a wounded human being, joy comes in and strengthens you. Are you listening to me, people of life? Uh, you may be in your night season, but I prophesy your morning is here. Morning, uh, joy coming in the morning. Uh, and for people of virtue, you need to know that God wants to do something phenomenal for us. Uh, and when we learn how to live in his presence uh, as a people of virtue, that manifest presence provides for us 
that manifest presence supplies for us. That manifest presence will heal us. Uh, it will deliver us. When Solomon uh, in 2 Chronicles 7 uh, had made an end of praying, the Bible says the fire of God fell and the glory of the Lord filled the temple uh, and the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the glory. Uh, when the manifest presence of God comes, uh, human inability ceases. Somebody said, God did that thing for me. Come on, God did. Not doing it, God did that thing for me. He knows. There's strength in his presence. There's gladness in his presence. Uh, there's generosity in his presence. Uh, there's breakthrough in his presence. Uh, there's life uh, transformative and life reforming power in the presence of God. That's why we worship him. Uh, that's why we sing songs to him. Uh, that's why we bless him. Uh, that's why we declare how holy he is. Uh, how righteous and all. That's why we lavish him uh, with words of deep appreciation uh, and adoration uh, because we desire the presence of God uh, and God designed us uh, to need presence. That's why when he made Adam, he came down the cool of the day and they had fellowship. May every disruptor of your fellowship with Father be overturned in the name of Jesus. Rise, O people of virtue. People of virtue purpose to abide in his paths with integrity. You can be in a God-ordained moment and lack integrity. That's why, that's why the scripture says those who walk along his paths with integrity. Come on, say, I am a vessel of virtue. I walk the paths of God governed by integrity. Come on, increase is my portion. Abundance is my portion. Healing is my portion. Longevity is my portion. Supernatural provisions, they are my portion. Divine preserving power is my portion. With God, I'll never fail. Come on, let's stand to our feet and put our hands together and bless the Lord. Come on, people of God. Put those holy hands together and bless him in this place. Hallelujah. I want you to lift your hands as you're standing. Father, we honor you. And to the online audience, we pray for just a time of visitation. We've earmarked uh, the remainder of this month, the month of May and the month of June, and even July as a time of special visitation and supernatural encounter for this people. Father, I'm asking you, to begin to move within our hearts and move within our lives and let the days of he who separates the holy from the vile be upon this house. Let the days of he who comes and sits among the people and refines them and raises up a congregation of virtuous ones uh, prevail in rivers Chicago. Let the, let, let the days of reconciliation be our portion, not just to man, but to the purposes and the promises of God, which are yes and amen. Where the previous season knocked the hope of God out of us, you're restoring hope to us. You're restoring the joy of salvation. You are breaking in as the Prince of Peace. You are coming forth as he who crowns those uh, that endure to the end and the blessing uh, of your goodness comes upon us. Uh, I pray for virtue uh, in our conversations. I pray for virtue and integrity in our dealings uh, one with another. I pray for every facade to be destroyed uh, during this season of supernatural encounter and that you would manifest yourself as the lifter of men. Uh, you'll begin to raise us up uh, from the dunghills of life and you'll set us among princes uh, and you will cause uh, your divine nature to prevail in us as a people of the word as a people of the spirit I give you glory for that I give you honor for that in the name of Jesus uh, and father even those that are going through in their minds uh, and there's been an invasion of their headspace uh, and there has come stress uh, there has come worry uh, anxiety uh, there has come problematic dreams uh, there has come this thing uh, where wicked imagery uh, has sought to rise up uh, within the framework of your thinking uh, I rebuke it uh, this morning uh, and I prophesy the peace of God over you but uh, you promise in your word to keep a mind in perfect peace that is stayed upon thee. So for every satanic mind mold, every, every mentality of torment, every agonizing thought, every assignment of worry and fear that would seek to ensnare your people, I rebuke it and I break it off of this house and I declare virtue and excellence and supernatural dealings are our portion. We are the redeemed of the Lord and the word declares let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you redeem, lift your voice and declare I am redeemed come on I am redeemed in the name of Jesus come on lift your voice and give him praise hallelujah 
I want you to remain standing. I told you we had a special presentation just for a time of corporate honor. We have in our midst, um, one of our members has done a superb job in really transcending some things that had been consistent, uh, perhaps in the natural realm, to uh, limit them, to restrict them. But they've risen in virtue and come to a different dimension of stature, capacity, and breakthrough. And now they're moving into a realm of leadership that is par excellent to say the least. None other than our very own Dr. Stephanie Cry. I want you to put your holy hands together as we call her forward. Come on people, let's bless the Lord and celebrate uh, this amazing gift to us. Come on people. Come on, let's bless our God for Dr. Stephanie. Hallelujah, we got a gift for you. Come on people, let's celebrate the Lord and bless this vessel. Hallelujah. And uh, as an added bonus for this day, Dr. Cross' mother is here. So we bless you, Mrs. Betty Leslie. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise for her mom. Uh, once we got uh, disclosure regarding her um, promotion, she's a big dog, big dog. I'm, she's a big dog. My wife sought in her heart to really just... Um, set aside some time to honor her and we had been so busy and I'm like no we need to get this done but we're doing it this day doing it that day well you know what her mom's here let's make it happen today so we bless you we celebrate you we honor the gift of you we appreciate you listen you got any children headed to college and you want to go the more excellent route through the city colleges of Chicago Dr. Stephanie leads an arm of the City College of Chicago as one of their like upper level executive leaders. And I had the privilege of doing a Zoom with some of her staff just for us to forge a connection as a local church and to have access to some of those bright minds. And so we, we celebrate you, we honor you, we bless God for you. We love you, honor you, we thank God for you. Uh, Dr. Stephanie is also starting a not-for-profit organization. More information will be forthcoming. She's been very diligent in participating in our women's um, Zoom book club. She's an amazing orator. I believe therapy is her, her specialty. So, <laughs> well, not her specialty, but she just had that gift of counsel. And she is a woman of God that you should know. She is a woman that you could glean from, genuine, just serving in rivers. And I believe in her personal life and business life as well. And I'm telling you, if you missed the Zooms, Women of God, John Jump on, men, you're welcome to join us too, but she is a well of wisdom, and we feel honored and privileged to have you as a member serving alongside of us. God bless you. So we're going to pray for her. Um, she's also an author as well um, of one book. She has more books coming out. Uh, so stretch your hands toward her. We just want to bless you. Father, we thank you for Dr. Stephanie Crom. We thank you for uh, the agenda of eternity, Lord, that is breaking forth in her life. And we thank you, Father God, that you have made all things new. And you have done a phenomenal work, Father, from uh, the time she has come to the Chicago area out of an act of obedience to your voice. And, Father, we ask that you continue to raise her up. We pray a hedge around her. We declare your preserving power around her. We declare, Lord God, you'll take her to higher realms, and out of her will come programs and curriculums, and there will come even the birthday, Lord God, of community advocacy campaigns to bless the disenfranchised. You will use this woman of God for your glory. So we celebrate her life. We bless her. We bless her mom. We thank you, Lord God, for the sovereign work you do through her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> I want to thank um, the Rivers family so much. When I came to Chicago four years ago, um, I was like, Chicago, God, are you sure it's Chicago? But um, I thank God for leading me to Rivers under this amazing leadership of Apostle and Prophetess. It's just been amazing. I've just seen how God has manifested in my life and have grown me in my prayer and teaching. And so I'm so happy to be a part of this family. So thank you. Come on, one more time. Let's give it up, saints. Hallelujah. We bless the woman of God. We thank God for all of you. Thank you so much, saints. At this time, we're going to receive our very own Pastor Alfreda. 
she's going to come and exhort us in giving. And then for the leaders, we got about a 10 to 12 minute window to transition. So make sure by 1215, you're at the designated place for our meeting. If you need an envelope, please get one. And uh, just as a, a word to really encourage you, uh, we're going to start these um, uh, healing, healing um, intensives led by our own prophet, Philip Harris. He and Bishop are just working on the time to really get that moving. And uh, we're going to do this for the rest of the year. It'll be spontaneous and at pop-up locations. Where we come together physically. That's why we got to get this building. We got too much we're called to do and too much that God has ordained. All right. So let's give the Lord a hand and praise for our very own Pastor Alfreda. Amen. God bless you, my family. It's time to give. It's giving time. Amen. I'm going to uh, read Deuteronomy 8.18 in your hearing. And it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto our fathers, as it is this day. Amen. Say, I am a covenant person. I'm a covenant daughter. I'm a covenant son. So it's my obligation through my virtue to be a giver. Amen. I mean, there's five ways to give that we have up on the screen here. You can give by way of text. You can also give by way of mail. It's P.O. Box 4315, Oak Park, Illinois, 60304. Also, our cash app, which is Dollar Sign Rivers, H O P, Zale, RiversChicago.com, and by way of our app. And if you don't have the app, I want to encourage you to download the app onto your phone. That is very convenient, amen, to, to give that way. So I want you all to stand to your feet. 